Welcome back, everyone. So now we're going to have a discussion continuing with tests, hypothesis tests from two populations. We're going to continue on looking at hypothesis tests for independent means between two populations. So, move this out of the way. <coughs> Our key concept here is we're going to be testing, we're talking about testing, comparing the means of two populations. But what we're really going to end up testing is the difference between the two population means. Big thing is this section we're talking about independent means, which means there is no, the, the two sample, the two populations don't overlap. They don't include any of the same data. And there's no logical pairing or matching between the two samples. So they're if they were dependent, in other words, they consist of matched pairs, then there's a link between the first item in sample one and the first item in sample two. The sim same link occurs between the second item in sample one and the second item in sample two. That's going to be the next section. That's going to be section 9.3. We're going to look at that a little bit later on. <clears throat> so what we're going to look at here, just like we did with proportions, we're going to do hypothesis testing where we can test a, a statement or a hypothesis about the mean, the difference of those two means. Excuse me, and we're gonna do confidence intervals. We're gonna find the related confidence interval that corresponds with our hypothesis test. So the vocabulary we're using here, um, symbol, symbolism, mu one is the, the population mean from the first population. Sigma one is the standard deviation of the first population. And N1 is the size of the sample that we choose from that first population. X bar 1 is the mean of that sample from the first population. And S1 is the standard deviation of the sample from that first population. Then, of course, we have all those symbols repeated with the little subscript of 2. Those are from the second population that we're looking at. So we have some requirements we have to meet, just like we had requirements for all of our other hypothesis tests. Now, first, we are going to assume in our testing here that we don't have any information about the population standard deviations. So we do not know the standard deviation of either population, and we, do, we cannot assume that those two populations have standard deviations that are equal. Now, that's really two different assumptions, um, but it... And then actually by making those assumptions, we make the process more difficult. But in general, those are the things that are, that are actually true. We, we very seldom know the population standard deviations. I mean, we're testing the means here. If we don't know the means, chances are we don't know the standard deviations. And the standard deviations usually are not equal. So we just assume both of those things are, are not true. And we go from there. We assume that the two samples are independent, which again means that the the populations are independent, and there is no link between the items in one sample to the items in the other sample. And both are simple random samples. So that all was really just the first assumption in our previous test. Now we do break them down into three separate assumptions. And then we either have to have large samples. So both samples have to be bigger than 30. If not, if, if the samples are small, even one of the samples are smaller than 30, then we have to know if the populations are approximately normally distributed. If they're pretty close, that's good enough. But if they're too far away from being normally distributed, we can't use these simple methods. We'd have to go to more advanced methods of hypothesis testing. So the test statistic we're going to use, since we don't know the population standard deviations, <coughs> excuse me, this is a t-test, so our test statistic is a t-statistic. It's the difference between the sample means minus the hypothesized difference between the population means. Now, in most cases, we're going to assume that difference is zero. And then this down here is just a way of combining the standard deviations from both samples to get a combined standard deviation, a combined variance. Um, actually combine standard error of those sample means that we can use for creating this test statistic. So, um, to find a critical value of T, 
Remember, the T distribution requires degrees of freedom. And for our one sample test, or one population test, it was just the size of the sample minus one. Um, here, we have two samples. So technically, the way to, do, to find the degrees of freedom is this formula down here, where A is the standard deviation from sample one squared divided by the size of sample one, and B is the standard deviation of sample two squared divided by the size of sample two. And then it goes into this formula here. We'll look at how that is calculated. Um, to be honest, that's much more accurate than this estimate that the textbook says, well, we can use a conservative estimate. We can take the size of sample one minus one and the size of sample two minus one, and you can use the more conservative of those. Um, the smaller one is the more conservative, but it's going to it's going to give us a possibility where we might fail to reject a value, uh, a, 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 the null hypothesis when maybe we should have. So it's it's okay if we're way if we're nowhere near rejecting or if we're way past rejecting, but if we're on the edge, um, that estimate could cause problems. So we're actually going to use this formula, and I'll show you how that formula works. So the p-values are automatically provided if you use technology. Again, they're talking about Excel. If you have that Excel stat, add on an Excel, that's great. I'm going to show you how to use stat crunch here and how to do the calculation by hand. Critical values are in that T distribution table A3. Again, remember, we can access that through my math lab, and I'll show you how to do that if we need to. So then, um, we also have confidence intervals we can do. And remember, we had that discussion about finding an equivalent um, percentage for the confidence intervals. We'll encounter that again in this example here that we're doing. This is just the, oops, let me highlight it a little too far there. This is just the point estimate of the difference between the means. So that's going to be, you know, the, Sample one mean minus sample two. So technically that usually ends up being x1 bar minus x2 bar. And then we subtract the margin of error and add the margin of error to that to get the two endpoints. And so that margin of error, remember, is our t critical and then times that combined standard deviation again from the two samples. Again, they're saying use your degree of freedom as the smaller of those two. We're going to use that formula that we saw up here, this formula here, to find an exact degrees of freedom to use. Now, remember when we did proportions, we said that the um, confidence interval method would vary slightly from the hypothesis testing. If it's a really close, it might give you a, a slightly different result because the percentage in the confidence intervals do, is not necessarily exactly the percentage of intervals that can that will contain the true proportion. When we're talking about means, the confidence interval is exact. So it will give you the exact same answer. It'll be exactly equivalent to any of the hypothesis testing methods that we do. So let's look at an example. Our example here is asking the question, are people getting taller? And so we're using data from the U.S. Army. Um, recruits, male recruits um, coming in from 1988. There's a sample of 12 recruits here. And then from 2012, we have a sample of 15 recruits. So we have the data. We need to find the summary statistics for that data. So I am going to Move this off to the side so I can get this entered into Excel. Excel shrunk down too so I can use it. There, I've got them side by side. This is 1988. This will be uh, 2012. So in 1988, we got 1698. 
I'm going to actually pause the recording while I enter these just so you don't have to sit there and listen to me enter. Almost finished entering here, so I'll turn the recording back on. I got just two more, 1794 and 1780. So those are the data points entered in for 1988 and 2012. Now I'm going to shrink this down a little bit. So that I'm going to put now here, I'm going to put the mean and standard deviation. So for the mean, for each, it's going to equal, oops, sorry, Excel command is equal average. I'm just going to find these values. Now I, I highlighted, I bolded and underlined the years on top just to make sure I don't accidentally include those in the data. So we get the mean for 1988 was um, 1,739.41 millimeters for 2012. It's 1,777.8 millimeters. That's approximately 1.77 or 1.78 meters in height. They're 178 centimeters. Um, so there's a difference there. This one is bigger, but remember, there's a possibility that we just when we randomly selected that we accidentally selected people that were shorter in this sample and accidentally selected people that were taller in this sample, and it might not truly reflect the true population values. Remember, the sample distributions can vary around the population mean as well. So we need to test to see, is this enough bigger that we can actually conclude that there is a difference? Let's see what the error is saying. Formula emits adjacent cells. Um, we're good with that. That one's working just fine. So now for standard deviation, we got to make sure we use the sample standard deviation. So it's stdev.s. And we'll do this one. And same here. So this one has a much smaller standard deviation compared to this one. Um, We'll now go through the process. We'll use that information to test to see um, whether they're equivalent or not. Now we could just, if you have Excel stat, you can go through the process of using Excel stat just to use these data lists. We don't, so we're going to go into stat crunch. Now I'm actually going to write these numbers down so we don't have to refer back and forth all the time. So for X1, it's 1739.417 and 66.60. And then for 2012, it's 1777.8 and 47.866. So first, let's do the requirement checks. Um, they are from two different populations. We do not know the standard deviations of either population, and we are not going to assume they're equal. So that takes care of that. They are independent because there's no overlap between them, and there is no logical pairing or matching between the two samples. The samples are simple random samples. And in this case, both are smaller than 30, so we do have to do a check. I'm going to have to check to see if they're approximately normal. Now, they say you can do a normal quantile plot for each data set, which works. It's a little more complex. Or we could do just a, like a box and whisker plot and see if it looks relatively symmetrical. Um, if we do that here, they do come out to be fairly relatively symmetrical, so we're good with that. So this is going to give you the Excel or Excel stat um, output. Now, Excel can do this without Excel stat. So here I'm going to go to two sample T or Z test. And it's going to bring up a menu for me. Uh, it's going to ask me to sign in. I might not be able to sign in here, so we may have to just go back to stat crunch. Give me just a second, I'll try to sign in. Okay, so it is going to require an administrative account, so I won't be able to do the simple version here in Excel because it's still requiring that. So let's go ahead and go to StatCrunch. So remember, StatCrunch is found right in our home page of my math lab. So I'm just going to click on StatCrunch, StatCrunch website, 
gets to be a lot of clicks here, you know. <coughs> Open stat crunch. And so I'm going to go ahead here and enter my data. All right, so you'll notice I entered the same data here into stat crunch. So we can go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go to stats, T stats, two samples. Now with data, because I have the data lists in here. If I had just the stats, let me show you what it would be if I just had the stats. Um, two samples, if I had some summary, you'd see I'd have to enter the sample mean, sample standard deviation, and sample size here. But since I actually have the data, we can make X, the stat crunch do some of the work for you. So with data, the first variable, the 1988, is in variable one. That's the title of the first column is variable one. Variable two is the second column with the 2012 data. Always leave this unchecked. We never want to pool the variances. Pooling the variances, we'll actually see that later in the presentation, really can only occur if we assume that the population variances are approximately equal. Well, that's a simplification of the process. We don't want to do that. Now here, our alternative hypothesis is going to be less than, so we're going to select that. And we're going to ask it to show the critical value so that we have that for us. And I'm going to ask for the summary statistics. So there's the mean and standard deviation for um, sample one and the mean and standard deviation for sample two, exactly what we got when we did it in Excel. Down here, this is the point estimate of the difference. Then that's the standard error once you combine it with those sample sizes. Degrees of freedom comes out to be 19.37. Now I'm going to show you where they got that by using that formula in a little bit. Um, we have the test statistic of negative 1.679 and the critical value of a negative 1.727. So remember, if we are looking at a bell curve here, a normal distribution, Since the alternative hypothesis is less than, we're rejecting if we're down on this tail here. Well, this borderline was that critical value, which was 1.727. The negative 1.727. If we get a value out here for our test statistic, we'll reject. Well, our test statistic was a negative 1.679. Negative 1.679 is here. So it is not in the rejection region. Also remember, if the p-value is less than alpha, alpha here was 0.05, we got a p-value of 0.0546. Or that is not less than 0.05. So we have failed to reject the null hypothesis here. Which is what the, this is identical to the information we would get from Excel stat or Excel. You can see there's our test statistic, negative 1.679, our critical value of negative 1.727, and our p-value of 0 0.0546. Well, what if we don't have Excel or Excel Stat to do this? Well, you guys, or Stat Crunch, I should say. You guys do have Stat Crunch, always available because you have it in my math lab. But let's say a year from now when you're no longer in the course, you wanted to do this. Well, we would need to set our hypotheses. Again, the, we're saying that the, the height in, is bigger now. So in other words, it was smaller back in 1988. So that's mu1 minus mu, is less than mu2. So the other side of that would be mu1 is greater than or equal to. So this, remember the one with equals to it, it <coughs> always becomes the null hypothesis. So this one becomes the alternative right down here. And so then the null becomes, we usually just put equal to in there, although we do really mean greater than or equal to there. And then we calculate the test statistic. So we're going to put our numbers in here, our sample numbers in here for um, X bar one and X bar two, and then our sample numbers down here for the standard deviations and the sample sizes.
So you can see if we put in those numbers, this, this is the mean of the heights from 1988, and this is the mean from 2012. Standard deviation from 1988 divided by squared divided by the sample size from 1988. And here is the standard deviation from 2012 squared divided by the sample size from 2012. Giving us a test statistic that we had from StatCrunch of negative 1.679. So if you're going to calculate that on a calculator, let's just kind of go through that. So 1739.417 minus 1777.8. Close the parentheses. Now we don't have to put in the minus one because that's not going to change anything. So we do divided by second square root. 66.601. I'm going to leave off the, the two there just because I only went to three decimal places when I wrote this down. Divided by the sample size of 12. Plus, not minus, plus 47.866 squared divided by 15 was the sample size of sample 2. Close the parentheses on the square root, and we hit enter, and there we get it. Negative 1.679 is our test statistic, just as given here. Finding the critical value is going to be more difficult. So this was saying take the two samples, sample sizes, 12 and 15. 12 minus 1 is 11. 15 minus 1 is 14. So we take the smaller one, which is 11, and we use that in the table. Now remember, to find the tables, we can come back here from our home page, and we can go to the e-text, open that up, and we can scroll down to Appendix A. Open up our tables and formulas. <coughs> and so um, this is a one-tail test because the alternative hypothesis is less than. So I got to go a couple pages here to get this is the binomial table. This will be the negative z scores, then the positive z scores. One more page, and we're in the t distribution table. If we use 11 degrees of freedom, that's this row right, right here. Um, we go over here to one tail is 0 0.05. That's this. And so that intersects down here, right there, 1.796. Now, we had said 1.727 was actually a critical value. So if you want to be more exact, I mean, they're saying 1.796 is what they're going to use here. Oops, where did they get it? Did they write it in here? They haven't put it in here yet, but 1.796 is what they're going to use. But what if we wanted the exact value? Let's come here, and we're going to use that formula. Remember, it was... A plus B squared over A squared over N1 minus 1 plus B squared over N2 minus 1. Well, the actual numbers there, um, for A, remember it's the, the standard deviation of sample 1, which is 66.601 squared over that sample size of 12, plus the standard deviation of sample 2, which is 47.866 squared over the size of sample 2, which is 15. And then we square that sum. And this is going to be over standard deviation of sample 1 squared again. So 66.601 squared over 12. And then we square that divided by 12 minus 1. And then plus standard deviation of sample 2, 47.866 squared over 15. We square that difference. And that's going to be over 15 minus 1. Now, I am going to just do this subtraction quick to make it easier to enter in the calculator. So 12 minus 1 is 11. 15 minus 1 is 14. So now we can enter this in the calculator a little bit easier. So I start with the parentheses. 66.601 squared divided by 12 plus 47.866 squared divided by 15. Close parentheses and square that. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Square that. Divided by, I'm going to do two sets of parentheses down here, 66.601 squared divided by 12. Close the parentheses and square it. Divided by the 11. Plus parentheses, 47.866 squared divided by 15. 
Close the parentheses and square that. Divided by 14, and then we close that up. We hit enter, and there we get 19.37. That's the exact degrees of freedom we had in StatCrunch here. 19.37 degrees of freedom. So we would round that to down to 19 to use that in our table. So we would actually be using this row here, 19. I'm going to highlight that with green. We're still using the 0.05 row, so it'd actually be, there it is, the 1.729, which is what Excel would use or StatCrunch would use as the critical value. So you can see that formula is a little tricky, but it's not terrible, and it allows us to do the exact test. If we use that approximation where we use the 11, the, the lesser of the two sample sizes, um, you can see there's if, if it's a really close test, we're going to get the wrong result. So I'd prefer to use the exact value using that formula. So we're going to get a t-critical. The t sub alpha over 2, if you will, of a negative 1.72. Where'd that number go? 1.729. There it is. I'm just going to put T critical down here, not T sub alpha over 2. So, since this is less than, if we get a test statistic less than that, we will reject the null hypothesis. The p value needs to be to know. Let's find the p value for our test statistic. We have a test statistic of a negative 1.679. It was not smaller than negative 1.729, so we failed to reject. But let's find the p-value for that. So again, we're going to use the 19 degrees of freedom. Here's the 19 degrees of freedom. Negative 1. Point, what was it? Negative 1.679 is between the 1.729 and the 1.328. Now remember, these are positive, but the negative we, we ignore the negatives on it. It's between those values, so that means if we go up here, this is a one-tailed test, that's telling us it is between 0.05 and 0.10. We don't get an exact p-value, but we know it's in that range that is between 0.05 and 0.10. Either way, we know it's not less than 0.05. So since it's not less than 0.05, our, which is our alpha value, our critical value, we again failed to reject the null hypothesis. So there is not sufficient evidence to conclude that there is a difference in the heights. or We should say there's not sufficient evidence to conclude that people are taller now than they were in 2012 than they were in 1988. So the appropriate interpretation, if we're asked, are people getting taller? Uh, we don't know is what we're saying. We did not prove that this, the heights were equal. We just failed to reject that they were equal. We failed to prove that they're taller. So we can't say that they're not taller. We just can't say that they are. So the answer to that question at this point is maybe. So if we use the critical value method, like I said, we found the t-critical using the formula, which was the negative 1.727. If you use the shortcut, which is to just use the smaller sample size minus 1, you'd get a t-critical of negative 1.769. The formula was not too difficult. We were able to get the real or exact critical value. And so that's our cutoff here. This is our rejection region. The test statistic, the actual test statistic of a negative 1.679 was out here, so it was not in the rejection region. So again, we failed to reject that null hypothesis. Well, let's now construct a confidence interval to confirm this test. Now, we were doing a one-tailed test, and this left tail had a probability of 0.05. Confidence intervals are always two-tailed, so we need an equivalent tail over here of 0.05. Well, if there's 0.05 or 5% on each tail, that means what's in here is 90%. So 90% would be the equivalent confidence interval for this. So if I wanted to go find my t-critical, I'm still using the 19 degrees of freedom, but we're going to use the 
column over here. Let's see if I can highlight it. Come on, highlight. No, it's not going to be. I've highlighted too much already. Um, so anyway, um, that's going to be 1.328 is what we would use as our T out sub alpha over 2. We could use Excel stat in, in um, Excel, or we could use stat crunch. Let's go to stat crunch, and I'll show you how that would work. So in stat crunch, I'm going to go through the same options, stat, T stat, two sample, with data. Select variable one column for the first data set and variable two column for the second. But now I'm going to select confidence interval, and I'm going to change this to a 90% and I'm going to show my critical value. So I hit Compute. There you can see, now it's still giving me the same T critical as before. Um, oh, which it should, because we are looking at, I should have correct myself here. Let me go back to this table. I should have been using a two table area, or two tail area, which is the 0.10. So that would have left me at the 1.729 as my critical value. So let me correct that. That it is 1.729 is my critical value, and so Excel stat gives us this confidence interval lower limit of a negative 77.865 to an upper limit of a positive 1.099. So, what that means is if we're looking at a number line here, let's put zero on the number line right there. We're going from a negative 77.865 to a positive 1.099. So we're barely above zero, but it is telling us that it is possible that the difference is that 1988 is smaller, but it's also slightly possible that 1988 is actually bigger. So there could be a positive difference. So because zero is in this interval, it is impossible for us to conclude any difference between those two samples or those two populations. If I wanted to calculate this by hand, here again, they're using that approximated um, critical value for T, if we use the exact one, the 1.729, we would actually get the exact same margin of error. So I'm going to recalculate this for you using 1.729 instead, instead of that approximate 1.796. So I use 1.729 times second square root, 66.601, I'm just going to round it to three decimal places, squared divided by 12 plus 47.866 squared divided by 15. Close my parentheses and hit equals. So I get 39.52 is my margin of error, my E. So then I would take my difference between these two. If I subtract them, I will get a difference of 1777.8 minus 1739.417. I get a difference of 38.38. So this here is 38.38 minus that difference of 39.52. Come on. And this here is, that was a negative, by the way, a negative 38.38 plus 39.52. Now, I put it in as this one minus this one, but it should have been subtracted the other way, which gave us the negative 38.38. Notice if we combine those, a negative 38.38 minus 39.52 gives that negative 77.9. Really close, so 
They had negative 79.4, but it's really negative 77.9, which is what we had up here. 70, negative 77.9. If I add those, I get a difference of a positive 1.14. 1. 1. Um, instead of the 2.77, that 1.14, again, really close to what we had here. Slight round off errors, but really close. So you can see we can use the exact critical value and get pretty close. Um, StatCrunch gave us that exact one, 77.865 to 1.099. And remember, that's exactly what StatCrunch gave us. I prefer to use StatCrunch for these. StatCrunch is set up, it's, it's designed to do statistics where Excel is designed to do so many other things. Um, I realize that once this course is over, many of you will not have StatCrunch available. Um, but if you're in a job where you're going to need to analyze statistics, you will have, in most cases, some sort of specialized software to do it. Uh, I wish I could load the Excel stat um, add-in to my computer to show you how to use the Excel stat add-in. Uh, but really, Excel is very clumsy on how it does this calculation anyway. So you can see the stat crunch is very, very simple on how that pulls that off. So then, we are. what this is saying is we are 90% confident that the difference between those heights could be zero, since zero is in the interval. So we cannot make any conclusions about whether people are taller or shorter than what they used to be. So a little bit of a couple, a couple of slides here to comment on that first assumption we made at the beginning of the test. Remember we said... First of all, that we did not know the population standard deviations, and we said that we could not assume they are equal. So we're going to look at that second piece right now of whether we can assume they're equal. If we can assume those are equal, well, then we can pool our standard deviations from the samples. And so what we do is we take the two sample standard deviations, and this is basically a weighted average. N1 minus 1 is the sample size from the first population, minus 1, times the standard deviation from that first sample squared. We do the same for the second sample. And then we divide by the total degrees of freedom. Then we use our degrees of freedom as just you add the two sample sizes together and subtract 2. Um, so 12 plus 15 here is 27 minus 2 would give us 25 degrees of freedom. Um, so it's going to be a little bit, little bit different. But again, we had to be able to make that assumption that the two population standard deviations were approximately equal. And so then once we pool the sample standard deviations like this, we use that in place of the standard deviation dollar formula. So this is S sub P instead of S sub 1 and S sub 2. We use that pool standard deviation in both of those. In this class, we're always going to assume, we're always going to work under the assumption that we cannot assume that those are equal, so we won't be able to do this. If this were a more advanced course, though, that uh, we would have to consider that option. It does greatly simplify the calculations. And so then when you do your confidence interval, you do the same thing. You'd replace S1 and S2 with that pooled standard deviation. And again, you'd use your N1 plus N2 minus 2 as your degrees of freedom. Next is, what if we actually know the population standard deviations? Well, this is very impractical because if we don't know the population means, how would we know the population standard deviations? But if that were the case, we just use the population standard deviations instead of the sample standard deviations. And you'll notice this is now a Z statistic. So we could use a Z critical instead of a T critical. And remember, a Z critical, we don't have to worry about degrees of freedom. So we don't have to worry about that big formula for degrees of freedom. And so it, it's the same formula for our confidence interval, only again putting in the population standard deviations instead of the sample standard deviations. Again, in this class, we're, we're never going to be given the population standard deviations. I'm just showing you this as a possibility so that if you ever go on to a more advanced statistics class, you're not shocked, you're not surprised when they come and say, hey, there is a method, a simpler method that could be used 
when you do actually know both population standard deviations. Now, moving on, in this case, we had independent means. Um, when we have independent means, our best strategy is to always assume we don't know the population standard deviations. So that means it's going to be a t-test instead of a z-test. And again, uh, make the assumption that we cannot assume that the two um, populations have equal standard deviations. So we will use the methods in this PowerPoint, basically, and we're not going to use any of those simplifications um, because those are things that are just not practical. Okay, so that's it for this session. Next, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about what if we don't have independent samples. There's a, when we're talking about means, there's a special case where we can have paired or matched samples that changes the process.